Friday. I believe it is the month of May, and I'm very sure that it is Friday. Really exciting show. Something brand new for us uh, on Best Served. We have Juan Padro from Culinary Creative, the CEO of that company, which includes restaurants like the Tappenberger Concepts, Bardo, Senor Bear, and a slew of others, as well as Paul Riley, chef proprietor of Beast and Bottle and Coperta. We're all in Denver, Colorado. So like I said, a little bit different this morning. And first, thank you guys for being on. I appreciate it. I know you guys have a lot going on. It is crazy times for sure. So thanks for being on. Happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. so, all right. So like I mentioned, a little bit different in that two guests on who are going to I don't even know if I call it a debate, but we're going to talk about some different topics that the two gentlemen may disagree upon. They may completely agree upon. They may have slightly divergent opinions or plans for their own restaurants, for their own teams. And so very different. I want to let everyone know a little bit about why this conversation came about. And then I want to let everyone know kind of what the platform is and the specific topics that we're going to talk about. So this conversation came about uh, last week, week and a half ago, when Eric Rivera, who's the chef owner of Ado in Seattle, penned an op-ed in Eater that was called Why the Chefs I Used to Admire Are No Longer the Leaders We Need. I might be paraphrasing there. Uh, and it got the three of us, as well as Lee Sullivan and Chef Adam Vero, onto a text thread. And we <laughs> ended up being half the day of us kind of just just distilling down the things in that article or at large that we were interested in, the things that were important to us, the things we completely diametrically disagreed upon. And at the end of it, we all said, cool, I really respect you and admire the work that you do. And we'll continue to look at you as a leader in the industry. And I was really struck by that. So this is the most important thing about this conversation. Is we're going to talk about some very practical things that these two gentlemen are going to be deploying for their own businesses we are also trying to lay down a roadmap for discourse to be able to potentially disagree or have varying opinions and still at the end of it, give a shit about each other in this industry, I think is a very important part. So that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to cover three topics just to kind of have a little bit of organization in this. We're gonna start with talking about the reasons or the, the, the understanding that you guys had for why your <coughs> restaurant is currently operating curbside or not during the dining room shutdowns. Sure. Oh, and my screen just went all fire on me. Hold on, technology boy. Well, I can, real. See, <laughs> I can see both of you just fine. <laughs> you guys again. All right. So that's the first topic. We're going to talk about curbside and staying in operation at this new model or shutting down completely in this time to kind of reset. Second, we're going to jump very forward as thinking about high-end dining, progressive, fine dining, chef-driven, full service, whatever we want to call it that the two of you operate most of your businesses in, what that looks like in your opinions coming out of this. And then we're going to go again to very practical, some of the steps that you all are taking as you look at potentially reopening your dining rooms and how you're deploying your PPP loans in this moment. All right. It was a fucking long intro. I, I appreciate uh, everybody's patience uh, in letting me digest all that. I also, very different than usual, will not be imparting my own opinions. And everybody who knows me or has watched this show, that is very difficult <laughs> for me to do, but I'm going to do it. This is about the two of you and the thought processes that you all have for the industry and for your people and your businesses. So we ready? Let's go. All right, let's do this. So uh, Juan, since you're right next to me, I'll, I'll start with you. You all are operating in multiple venues, doing curbsides. Why was that important for you to do through this versus shutting down since your dining room capacity was turned to zero in this time? So, um, you know, I think that for us, 
um, you know, we kind of got out ahead a, a little bit of, of all this stuff. Um, you know, we knew stuff, we, we knew things were coming down. And um, even before Mayor Hancock announced, uh, we had had a plan that we were going to, that we were going to roll out. We anticipated some closures. We didn't know how long and, and the severity of things, but, um, but, you know, I think uh, having, I had a pretty like um, incredible experience after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, and I saw how important food and restaurants and how important the chefs were and the operators were to the community and to the recovery of uh, of that island after that um, after that crisis. And uh, I really came back from Puerto Rico with um, just a renewed uh, pride in, in the restaurant industry and how it, like the role that it can play uh, in society. That's beyond just an entertainment piece. It's also um, a necessity, um, you know, in, in, in times of need and providing food. It's a resource for food and, um, and, uh, and it's a, a sanctuary for, for a lot of people. Um, and, uh, and a distraction that's that's necessary. Um, and uh, as w- the other thing I saw down there was as things started to um, get worse, uh, the food supply started to get a lot more challenging, and, and people couldn't go to the grocery stores. There were lines to get in, and, and and you know similar to what we saw you know here, you had a lot of people that um, you know kind of went to the grocery stores that you know they obviously bought up all the toilet paper, but uh, they bought up other stuff too, and um, so. You know, that was it was a no brainer for me to stay open. And uh, and 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 I think that (laughs) the expectation for, um, you know, for my uh, the the kids that work for us, did we lose Paul? We lost Paul. He'll come back. Don't worry. Keep going. You're on a roll. We're going to figure this shit out. Just like everything else. Technology is broken, too. Yeah. Yeah. you know, the expectation that the kids who work for me have is that we're, uh, you know, we're very proactive. We're not a reactive organization. Um, you know, we don't wait and see, we try to dictate. And, uh, and, and, and in this case, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to go out. We knew people were going to need us. Um, and, uh, and we wanted to, to make sure that we were taking care of our own, that we were communicating well, that we were structured well, that we were safe, that we were feeding the people that needed it in the community that didn't have, uh, resources. Um, and, uh, and that was what our role was going to be, uh, in the restaurant. So everything begins with, um, taking care of the most vulnerable. So within your organization, within your community, within your state, country, everything starts there. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and restaurants play a big role in that. And I think that that's why it's so important that they're open. How'd you go about that practically then having, I mean, you have 400 employees thinking about who and how you're actually going to operate that, making sure that, you know, you're keeping them safe and, and all that. What was the thought process and then the execution on that? So, uh, immediately, you know, uh, we actually had a meeting scheduled for noon on that Monday, uh, when Hancock came on at 1130. Um, so, uh, we rolled out our plan, which was, which was a set, you know, we had a little bit of an adjustment cause you know, he announced the immediate closure, but, um, but that was just to really set the expectation and, and, and allow and, and, and talk to our leaders, um, about how to communicate with their staffs and, uh, and how this stuff works, how does crisis work? Um, and you're going to see a lot of stuff on TV that's going to, uh, impact you mentally, um, and, uh, how to decipher information. Uh, we set up a a tree. So our staff, everybody in our, in our company, every 48 hours got touched, um, so that we were communicating and making sure that our, our own people were safe. Uh, we furloughed, um, you know, probably three quarters of the folks that work for us. And, uh, but we, we made a decision that we were going to, uh, take care of their benefits. So that all their benefits were, were completely paid for by the company. Um, and then in any crisis you need the essentials and that's water, light, a roof over your head and food. Um, so in, in America, we're super blessed, you know, it's not like in Puerto Rico where they didn't have any of the four, uh, here we have most everything, but you know, obviously food is challenging, uh, getting to the grocery store, leaving your house, you know, those types of things. So, uh, we wanted to make sure that all our folks were fed every day. So we set up 
Sloan's Tappenberger as sort of ground central uh, for that. And then we uh, consolidated Bardo and Ashkara under Bardo's roof, uh, Highland, uh, Mr. Rosso, and Senor Bear under one roof. Uh, and that was just basically to kind of control all the elements and, um, and uh, you know, kind of take the burden off of, um, off of each individual store and, and, and kind of, you know, cross-utilize resources. So uh, when we got the PPP money, we kind of uh, we, we started opening up, you know, all the other restaurants um, just to kind of reemploy our folks. That's a reemployment program. And uh, and we restructured the entire company. So we're not we're not structured like a restaurant. We're structured like a, a corporation, essentially. So uh, we have, um, you know, folks that are doing the tasks in the restaurant. So we have, you know, we have our front of the house and our back of the house. But we also have, you know, kids that are artists. So we're putting them to work. We have well, Juan, let me let me pause you real quick because I want I want to get back to the actual opening, <laughs> like kind of post post COVID dining rooms, all that. So let's get back to that. So, Paul, I want to want to get you in here. So, uh, for you, Beast and Bottle, Coperta, Pizzeria <laughs> Coperta, you, you shut down completely, correct? And talk about for you why that was. I'm sure the hardest decision ever, but for you, an important decision. Yeah. Um, so, kind of like what Juan was saying, we had a little bit of heads up because on that. Which was the 14th. Um, the city actually closed the food hall where Pizzeria Coperta is. And so we kind of had a bit of a heads up that something was going to be coming. So on Saturday, we had the forced closure of the pizzeria. Yeah. Um, and then, kind of internally, discussions among my partners and myself, we were making plans for what was inevitable. When the mayor shut everything down on uh, it was that Tuesday morning, the seventeenth. Uh, these the models closed anyway on Monday night, and um, so Coperta was open that night. Um, but yeah, to the, what you said, the um, the most difficult decision, or the most impossible decision, I think, is the way I really look at it. Of we're going to close down, we're going to lay off everybody. Um, including myself and my partners. Uh, there was a brief discussion about doing takeout that night or uh, that night for the future. And um, we, not, takeout sales at my restaurants are less than 3% overall. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that I'd say we are great at. I just don't have a lot of experience in it. And um, so that seemed like a challenge. Also, we gathered up our managers and said, how are you guys feeling about this? And they they were not feeling it. They There was at that time, and I still think now, there's still a lot more questions than answers coming from our um, being handed down to government officials and to how this is actually supposed to go, how it's going to go. And from an ownership side, from a financial side, I had a ton of questions on how this is going to go. And uh, we just tried to in oh. that it was best – let me, let me pause the you safety quick. of our team yeah. and the safety of our guests to, to close down. And it, it's still. I'm going to reset real quick. Your, your audio is coming through. Okay. Your video is hot garbage, but hold on a second. <clears throat> See if. I think Paul said he's on a desktop one. I didn't even know those existed anymore. <laughs> All right. Hold on, people. This is par for the course right now. We're going to get Paul back in here. All right, Paul. Let's try this again. Uh, your uh, your feed is, is pretty rough right now, but uh, let's see if we can't power through. Can you hear us? Juan, I might just take Paul's position and, and uh, you know. He's, I, he's moving, though. I see him moving. Paul, can you hear us? I can hear you guys talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's we were making fun of you because you have a desktop. I didn't even realize yeah. that. 
still a thing. And if it seems like the camera and audio of that is, is uh, ancient. <laughs> So Paul, you left off that right where I heard was at your managers and, and they just weren't feeling it. And, and then you talked about the fact that the city really hasn't come down with any kind of further information. That was good. That was good, Juan. Co-host material right there. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's some good color commentary there, uh, Vince Scully. Uh, <clears throat> yes. So we look kind of, can you guys hear me okay now? Yeah, we can hear you. Can't see you very well, but we can hear you, man. Okay. Keep talking. Um, <laughs> great. So, yeah, I mean, we, we kind of decided that the safety of our of our team and thus the safety of our guests was really the most paramount thing. That was the one solidified answer that we had during that time. And, and we wrote that out. And, you know, I think... Juan, your, your your discussion of the um, you know essential work versus luxury. You know, our restaurants are they essential? Or are they a luxury? I go back and forth with that a lot. Um, yeah. What what I do know is that the only the essential that I know is that my my team is essential, and the restaurant is essential to them. And I think that doing everything in my power to protect that was was kind of the ultimate goal in making that decision makes a lot of sense so uh that was something interesting the luxury because something that eric rivera and i talked about on wednesday was how uh the guys at 11 madison park the reason that he included them in kind of his berating of a lot of the leaders in the industry was because of the fact that they were quoted in multiple articles talking about luxury and how they wanted to kind of be part of redefining what luxury means and which is a big challenge. Juan, you very specifically took one of your concepts, Bordeaux, you know, award-winning concept and, and its iteration in New Orleans, just one restaurant of the year. And you now are doing a sandwich place called Jabroni and Sun. So for you, did you feel like right away, and this will segue right into the future of the chef driven, the high touch hospitality, Let's get into that part. Why was that important for you? Do you feel like that that's a necessity right now? That luxury. Well, we're both, <clears throat> we're, we're not operating both restaurants. Bardo still operates at night and Jabroni's during the day. So, uh, but what we did do, you know, maybe this, you know, which will probably answer your question here is that, you know, with all of our menus, we pared down and became, you know, it, it became about providing food, simple food that was, um, you know, easy to eat, easy to prepare uh, in terms of like meal kits and stuff like that for, you know, taking big meal kits and stuff like that for, for families and, uh, and, and that stuff, you know, when you're, when you're in a time of crisis is what's most important, <clears throat> you know, you're not trying to provide, you know, the senior bear, you know, restaurant experience right now. You're, 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 you're providing a service to your community. So does that mean for you that, Senor Bear and is frivolous because it's not needed right now. Is there a moment when it is needed again? What's your thought on that then as far as what's happening now versus the, the future of the expectation of those high touch hospitality experiences? Well, those are a few questions you just asked. So um, I'll start with the first one, which is, uh, is Senor Bear frivolous right now? The type of cuisine, you know, let me, uh, let me put it this way. There's no tweezers in our kitchen right now. You know what I'm saying? So we're making tacos and we're making enchiladas and, and uh, we're doing things that are that are pretty simple. And, and uh, you know, we're fortunate that we're able to sell alcohol. That's a luxury that, you know, you know, most countries don't have uh, the ability to do that during these times. But um, and that's good for the business. But again, the business for us, I want to emphasize this, you know, um, the business for us was secondary. Um, and uh, and and it was, you know, Katie and I had a conversation about that. Um, you know, uh, the night, uh, that Monday night when Hancock made his announcement and, you know, she's like, you know, and, and Katie, as you know, is my business partner, also my ex-wife. So we have a, a pretty rich history and, and we had an incredible conversation. And, you know, for us, we just made the decision that, um, that we were going to go out and we were going to take care of, uh, you know, make sure our kids were fed and, and had health care and, and make sure that our community was taken care of. And if we lost every restaurant, that didn't matter. 
um, because it wasn't going to take our brains away and it's not like we couldn't reopen them. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, that's the bottom line for yeah. us, you know, the, the, the actual business itself, uh, just really wasn't that important compared to what our ability to go out and, and serve our community was, that was what was most important. Yeah. Paul, for you then, you, know, you mentioned that Sago is such a small part. You're built in a very different way. You are definitely that chef driven, progressive, high end, high touch hospitality type location. So when you're thinking about the potential for what is expected of you or what the need in the market is for you, when you think about the future of high end cuisine, are you worried? Is that a concern? Are you looking to make the pivot? Where, where's your head at with that? Yeah, uh, it's a great question, and I, I the the easy answer is the restaurants that we closed in March will not be the restaurants that will you know, and, and we're we're hoping to and we're planning creating budgets to be open by the end of this month um, for both locations. So um, the restaurants that closed in March mostly in the same uh, family <laughs> really, uh, as, as the ones that are going to open in May. But, um, but it, it's going to be a matter of, um, I think, taking what we, we have now, both concepts are, and creating something that is that one that can help um, and two that it's just going to be made or currently in right now. Um, I mean, as far as the future of high end cuisine, I it'll it'll come back. I have I have no doubt about that. Um, I don't think you're going to see it right away. Maybe even not for this year. But um, but if you look at when the birth of the current, um, what are you? Poor Paul, man. <laughs> oh, rough day for Paul. <laughs> Paul, if we were going to crown a winner to this debate or this banter or whatever, I think just their technology is, is failing you, buddy. Let's see if we can get him back. I might have to try and get him on a different device and see if we can't get him in here. Uh, all right, so let's move into opening. You kind of mentioned a couple of things when you have your PPP loan. Uh, yeah. I want to restart there because you specifically mentioned that and then mentioned that you're bringing back staff because of it. When you thought about PPP loans, and I've heard a lot of different ways that people are thinking about that, and they thought about it as a way to ramp up for reopening, but they didn't know when they could reopen their dining rooms, how they were going to allocate that money. At a high level, when you think about PPP, is it a deferment of unemployment to be able to get your people back on, or is it a bailout? at a high level, those seem like the two kind of camps that I hear a lot. Where's your head at with that? You know, it's a one part of a, a greater solution. I mean, I don't think it's either. I mean, it doesn't, you know, I mean, it's somewhat of a bailout, I think for, for businesses and it, you know, it's not a great bailout. I mean, it doesn't really allow you to, it's not super flexible in terms of its terms and things like that. And, and, uh, and the forgive, you know, as it pertains to forgiveness, um, but you know, it's, it's just one piece of the puzzle, you know, you got to look at everything holistically and, uh, you know, debt is going to be part of the solution and, you know, no people are really scared about going into more debt. Well, you know what? I mean, unfortunately that's the situation that we're in. So either accept it and figure it out or don't accept it and don't open. I mean, that's, that's really what the two choices are. And, uh, and, and, and nobody wants to be in more debt, nobody, but that's, that's part of what this, you know, what's going to have to happen here. And then, um, in terms of like bringing people back, um, you know, I don't, I don't really give, you know, they, they have rules for forgiveness, but they don't have necessarily rules for the PPP. I mean, like in general, you know, if you, if you want to take on the debt and that's part of your strategy, then use it the way you want to use it, man. Um, so, um, you know, for us, it, it made sense to, to keep our kids as active and engaged as possible. Um, I think it's a real, it's, a, I think you're, you're, it, the mental health risk of uh, letting people just sit at home and, and, and watch Fox News and CNN and listen to all the misinformation out there 
Um, I think that that's irresponsible. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, that messaging is, uh, is, is, is really, really, really bad. And, uh, and, and, and it worries me that, uh, that, that, uh, people just said, Hey, they're going to make more money on unemployment. Let them sit at home and do that. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. Yeah. Let's unpack that a little bit because <laughs> that's an important part of it. The mental health of our industry yeah. is already in turmoil and it has been for a long that's time, right. a whole other conversation for sure. Yet in this moment, what I'm interested in is the fact that we are built on the face-to-face -face interaction and yeah. what that really represents to us is pretty important. So uh, I think it actually, I think it was you who talked about physical health versus mental health. So maybe what's your, go, go a little deeper in your thinking in mental health versus physical health in this moment. I mean, the, I mean, mental health, you know, that a lot of this stuff's going to manifest in, in, you know, six, 12, 18 months, you know, down the road, you know, um, anxiety, depression, things like that. I mean, people, these are traumatic times for people. So, you know, <clears throat> it's the, the way you communicate and the relationships that you have with your, with your staff, I think is paramount. Um, and, uh, in terms of like physical harm, um, you know, I don't want to minimize, you know, minimize what this is. It is a terrible, um, you know, pandemic that we're going through. We've never seen anything like it before. Um, but, you know, we've in general, you know, I think I want to be sensitive to people on this, but, you know, you're going to get it likely at some point, you know, and uh, and it's going to go in your body and it's going to go out of your body and you're going to survive it. Um, the, the best way with any, you know, type of contagious disease, uh, is to follow really good protocol. Um, and I'm going to tell you that, you know, when you, after a hurricane, um, or after a tornado or after a, an earthquake, um, you know, there are some pretty gnarly diseases that are, that, that, that you can get. And, um, and, and, and you got people down there that are, that are risking their lives, uh, you know, dealing with malaria and, 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 and things like that. So, you know, this is an unprecedented, it's unprecedented in the U S you know, and I hope that the people in the United States are more empathetic to people in the rest of the world. We haven't had to deal with this. Uh, but you know, there are countries where, you know, this type of stuff is a way of life. Um, so, you know, you've got to be able to, you know, in, in, in my mind, I'm not judging anybody for, um, you know, kind of, their their reaction to this it's that's not fair you know for me to judge how they're you, you know what their feelings are but the reality is for me um this is stuff that's very manageable um and uh, i didn't see any reason why um why we couldn't operate so paul for you when you're thinking about the specific topic of the mental health versus the physical health of your people getting them to work <clears throat> sitting on their couches all of the all of those type of conversations Where's your head at with that when you're thinking about reopening and trying to bring people back safely, but also knowing, you know, there's challenges like some people are making more money on unemployment now than they would coming back to their regular position. So maybe uh, distill that a little bit for us. Sure. Can you hear me better? I hope you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You look great. great, man. You did uh, it. You figure shit out. That's <clears throat> cool. we do. It's the problem solver. <laughs> um, I, that, that, that to me is a topic that has only, we've only scratched the surface of the, the mental anxieties, the mental exhaustion of, of how, I mean, and it's not just restaurant people, it's, that's going to be everybody. Right. Um, and how much is going to come out of this. Um, you know, I, I think certainly when we do reopen, we're going to be opening like Juan said with not, you know, limited staffing, it'll be limited hours, limited menu, limited seating, which all necessity, which all means less staffing. Um, how less right now is hard to say. Um, but uh, I was actually down at Beast and Bottle and compared to the other day and measuring off how many seats we were going to have with six feet from each other. It's maybe it, it averages to about 50% capacity. So, um, um, you know, that it just necessitates less staff. In, in terms of um, how I think we're going to, when we do bring people back, um, the very first question that I'm going to ask is, are you ready to work? And I mean, I, and I've been asking that among my chef team um, 
for about the last seven to 10 days. And um, it's, I feel like the, the momentum to come back is slowly building. Um, and I was kind of telling you before, Jensen, we, we did a video with the, with the, with the tire, uh, the boat from the day, just about what our plans were. And I had most of my employees, most of our team, most of our staff check back in with me and say, Hey chef, thanks for looking out for our safety first. We're good. We're financially sound right now. Um, I'm a little bored and I would love to see everybody, but, um, but you know, thanks for, thanks for putting us uh, at the top of your, um, at the top of the, of the list, I suppose you would say. So um, I think that the, the plans that we could to, to, to come around long story long here, the plans that we currently have for dealing with mental exhaustion, mental health, within our restaurants will just be more at the forefront, I suppose. I mean, not that it already isn't, um, but I think it's going to have to be very, even more checking in with teams, like, how are you doing? How are you handling this? How's the poor family? Um, which those questions get asked a lot um, now, but I think it's going to have to be going from a daily thing to – I don't know maybe an hourly thing. I'll, I'll have to see when we get back in there. Yeah, Paul, maybe slide over. We see like half of your face. I can see it all. Dude, you're too pretty to not have your whole face on, man. Come on. I'm figuring this thing out, man. Dude, hey, this is it, man. People are going to message me left and right and be like, you know, my favorite part is when shit got fucked up because that's how it feels. And he's gone again. He's yeah. gone again. Crazy. This is, this is real life for sure. Oh, now he's back quick, though. Look at this. Boom. At least you're getting it figured out, Paul. Uh, uh, <laughs> Don't touch any buttons, Paul. Come on. So, Paul, technology is not a fallback plan for you. <laughs> yeah. Never has been. Yeah. yeah. Get this you. guy a whole lamb that he can break down because this yeah. using of robots is not working for him. You, you, you'll actually, like, th this will be funny because my, my entire staff knows how technically challenged I am. So this <laughs> kind of goes <clears throat> For sure. Uh, I hope they, I hope they, the extent of my technology. I hope they screenshot this and make it a meme that hangs on the wall in all of your <laughs> restaurants. That, yeah. that would be a big win for me, if nothing else. So, all right, same question for you. You got a PPP loan as well. Yep. Give us your thinking on PPP. Why you got it? What you're planning to do with it? Kind of yep. any of the uh, challenges that you see? Not in acquiring it. We know that was fucking crazy, but actually deploying that money thoughtfully forgiveness, kind of those items for you? Sure. Um, the PPP it isn't perfect. And I think, I, Juan, I didn't hear what you were saying before uh, about it, but I, I know you and I have spoken about it. Yeah. Um, and thanks for your help, by the way, with everybody. I, I know the whole Denver community can thank Juan for his guidance on how that's been going for everybody. So much obliged, bro. Um, the P we didn't get the first round. We got the second round. So we were definitely holding our breath that that was going to come through. We have it now. Um, we're we're sitting on it right now. I mean, I I, I shouldn't say uh, no. We are sitting on it actually, and sort of biding our time because, uh, like Juan, I have been on lots of different calls, webinars with local leaders and politicians, heavily lobbying for the extension of terms for the PPP. Yeah, that's going to happen. So yeah, it sounds like it is going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and the latest I heard right now is that you're, it's still going to be eight weeks, but you're going to have like a 24 week window to use it, um, which is better than the current idea um, or the, better, better than the original one, I should say. But um, um, we are, I mean, like I said to you before, we, we are creating budgets for both restaurants that look completely different from the budgets that we made at the beginning of the year. Uh, and PPP is going to help out with that. Uh, and I think that it makes, and I, I wonder, Juan, if you would agree with this, that um, if you have the PPP, even if you're on the fence about reopening your concepts, whoever that is, but it makes sense. The, the, the forgiveness is, is great. I mean, it, it, it's, it makes, it's, it's going to be beneficial to get your doors open and just see what happens, I think. 
And um, yeah, it's a part of the strat. My my thing that maybe you didn't hear was it's it's just one part of your strategy. And if you want to use it, and you and your and your goal is forgiveness, that option is there. But our part of our you know solution I, is I that think you heard you say that your guys are you're going to continue to expand, right? Well, no, the PPP, it's like, we're, you know, we're going to, some of it's going to turn into debt, you know, mm-hmm. because you just, you only need so many people, but, you know, so, and that's okay by us, you know, we, we, we accepted that. So that's, you know, that's part of our, that's part of our strategy, as will other debt vehicles be part of our, part of our strategy. So, but we want to get the best terms and that, you know, the focus really needs to be, we don't have a great representation in the independent restaurant world, um, you know, talking about what the needs of independent restaurants really are and actually laying out a strategy on how this should work. You know, the the most recent thing I saw, you know, I've got Bennett and, uh, and Gardner's plans right here in front of me. And, you know, one is, you know, one is to let you top off your PPP and one is to say, Hey, you know, we have a seven year note for restaurants. That's not great debt terms, you know, so we need to be focused on on things that work for uh, for the longevity of the industry, having a long view and not like a short term. OK, we're going to lift you up and, and, and then leave you out to figure it out in two years. You know, that doesn't make yeah. sense. Well, one thing I've definitely learned from just talking with other, you know, proprietors, restaurateurs is that there really isn't one you know, perfect, not what perfect, but one way to do this. It really, it really depends on what the needs of your business are. Yeah. And, and, it, and that's going to look different from one restaurant to another. And I think, um, you, you know, you're going to, and, and I even hear that about how everybody's that, you know, that sense can be uh, applied to how everybody's going through this. Like there's kind of no one way to weather this storm. You got to do what's right for you and you got to stick to it. Yeah. So I want to get back to like very specifically how you guys are going to be operating your businesses coming out of this. But I'm thinking more when you potentially have full capacity. Paul, I want to start with you. Is Beast and Bottom Coperta going to be exactly what it was pre-COVID-19? How do you see you needing to or do you need to adapt to kind of a new expectation of, again, that chef driven high end dining scene? Yeah. Uh, look, I, think I started to talk about this before, before I disappeared, but uh, in the get-go, it will look different. It has to. If for, the, for the survival of the, of the restaurant, it has to look different. The minute that we can get back up to full capacity, the only way it's going to look different is that it's just going to be better. Because as a, as a team, we're, you know, you're going to have creative minds, creative people coming together for a driven, for a driven purpose, and that's to keep – pushing our restaurants to excellence. And I think it's times like this that can only help that kind of experience among a team. And I, and um, my hope is that that happens sooner than later. I'm not betting on that right now, but, um, but I believe that when we are at full capacity and I'm able to offer, you know, a menu similar to what it was like on March 16th, the restaurants are only going to come out of it for the better. I think you're going to, you know, take a look at the reality of, of the world as a, as a whole, this isn't necessarily a decision. That's just a, you know, uh, a social distancing decision, uh, Jensen. And, uh, you know, uh, we've got 26 million unemployment claims, you know, in 2008 in the worst recession in the history of the United States, we had 2.6 million. Okay. That's 10 times as many unemployment. We just took a sledgehammer to the economy and uh, we're going to go into a recession. No doubt. And, you know, so we need to we need to be talking about that. We need to accept that and we need to provide solutions for our community around that. And, you know, that's why these eight weeks, 16 weeks solutions don't make any sense at all, to be honest with you. They're band-aids. Um, so, you know, what does this stuff look like over the next three to four years? You know, um, and that's the long term view. And, uh, and, and, and and look, recession doesn't mean you can't open businesses. It doesn't mean you can't be successful. It doesn't mean you can't sell it, you know. <clears throat> what it means is that you have a different economic climate that you need to be prepared for. And, um, you know, super high end restaurants and recessions, you know, survive in New York and San Francisco. They don't survive in smaller towns, you know. So Marin would be, you know, a similar concept that we might have to something that Paul does. And uh, and, you know, we got to we're going to reconcept that, you know, so it's it, it's just the bottom line. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. And that's OK. You know, I mean, so we all of us have There's nothing wrong with that. And I hope no. 
I hope that the dining public is accepting of that, 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 you know, for a while things are going to be uh, a little different and restaurant and like, yeah, your favorite restaurants going to look different. Come and support us still. <laughs> Come be a part of our community still. But here's 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 an opportunity though, Paul, and that is that you know we always we I'm sure you know under your roof as we do under our roof that we talk about like educating the consumer when they're in the restaurant and that's part of the service thing, right? But but the impact that chefs can have, I think, in the next couple of years is huge. It's bigger than ever, and this is why. The public doesn't know where to buy. They don't know how to eat, you know, and and right now all they're hearing is, oh, my God, I got to get something organic or, oh, my God, I got to get something because I need to be healthy. Chefs have an opportunity. We need as an industry to lift up guys like Paul and Max and uh, Alex Seidel and Jen Jasinski and people like that, that uh, that really just know way more than all of us. But they know way more than I do. And I'm a restaurateur. You know what I'm saying? And, and these guys can go and they can help, um, you know, really change the way people think about food. When they're making a burger, okay. When they're making a damn burger, so that needs to happen. And uh, and, and 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 again, you know, I'm going to keep harping on it. We need an organization to kind of get behind and start message getting that messaging out, you know, to the consumer um, because people want it right now. They're listening. You have a captive audience. Well, and Paul, they want it. Yeah, yeah, please do. To, to, build, to build on exactly what Juan was saying is. Um, if, if you look around right now, I mean, look, factory farming is crumbling right now, right? Yeah. It's, it's showing that it has an Achilles heel. And, um, what I have been preaching with, with chefs, the chefs that you just mentioned, Juan, what, what I have been kind of preaching and how we, how we educate our staff, uh, is almost like, it's almost like our thesis statement right now, that some good is going to come out of that, to, that people are learning that they can buy local meat still even though there's no meat at king super well guess what i just spoke to our ranchers and they have tons of meat yeah um yeah you know people are putting more of a value on food because they have to and this is the this is the kind of thing that we have been talking and preaching within our walls for the last seven years so to see that coming around right now you know ah <laughs> he was on right, the phone. He was say, wanted to hear. <laughs> yeah, dude. And you were about to hey! mic drop too. You were like on a roll, man. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Put me on my pedestal. Um, uh, uh, but it, what I was about to finish saying was that just that it, everything that we've been talking about, everything that we've been saying within our walls, is 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 coming full circle i guess you could say in that sense right now which is it's it's empowering it's awesome yeah yeah and 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 i think in you know for me as i'm not a chef you know i can cook and i know probably you know more, chef. <laughs> I, I i know a couple chefs and i can cook probably a little bit better than the average person but you know but for me you know it is a, we have an opportunity. We, we've always talked about chef driven. And as a business guy, when I hear chef driven restaurants, I'm like, Oh my God, that's a high yeah. risk proposition. Oh, yeah. um, but we have, a, we have a chance to like lift up this, this, this particular uh, uh, piece of our community, the chefs uh, in, in leverage their intellectual property. And, you know, we should be selling their goods um, you know, we, we launched that marketplace yesterday, um, and, uh, it went bananas by the way. Um, awesome. and, um, and, you know, we're going to create a whole sh chef uh, driven section there where chefs can, their rubs and their dressings and their sauces and, That's and, uh, yeah. you know, and, and the thing and, is, and that plug you, that one real quick, plug that, tell everyone where they can find that. Yeah. That's denverbazaar.com. You, yep. you can kind of take a look at that and there's meal kits and things like that there, but you know, restaurants like Paul's restaurant. I mean, he buys dairy that you can't get in a store. I guarantee it. You know, I mean, like that's the stuff that we need to promote and we need to get out to the community and we can, I mean, the, the ability to impact and change people in a time of crisis is greater than any time in our entire life. Amen. And we need to capitalize on it. Yes. Yep. One of the things I told, I said, I wasn't going to put my opinions in. I can't fucking help myself. I think I'll that every single restaurant, 
<laughs> because I did pretty good. I did pretty good. Every restaurant has to get into CPG in some format. You need to be in consumer product goods. You need right. to be selling your rubs, your salsas, whatever defines you, because the ability to drive bottom line in your four walls is so fucking stressed and so difficult in the framework right. that we live in currently for you not to have revenue streams outside of your four walls, including delivery. And it's easy to demonize delivery apps. They fucking suck. But the people that want your food in their homes are the greatest asset you could ever imagine. So I, I like right. very much think that there's an opportunity there. I also think to the point that both of you are making, the chef now and chefs like Paul, Alex, Jen, so many others have taken a leadership roles and being more than chefs of what goes on the plate. And I know Juan, you specifically said what goes on the plate isn't going to matter to the degree of the swooshes of sauce nobody gives a shit about aren't going to matter. It's going to matter more and more all of the ecosystem that goes into getting food onto that plate. So when we're thinking about that, Paul, for you, how then are you, and, and then I'll come back to you, Juan, as well. This is a question for you. As a chef, how do you not stifle creativity, but focus it, knowing that the simplicity that's going to be expected and needed for businesses to survive and thrive how do you then, hey, now Juan disappeared. All Just right. Me, bro. <laughs> it's perfect. For you, how do you then not chef it up too much? Because yeah. there's a, a big cost in that and focus on the simplicity in the way that you're talking about getting food to the plate. Totally. Um, it, it, it almost seems like it, it seems like a no brainer to me that it's just going to happen because how you can, quote, chef it up is by. I, I think this for me this is going to be a real challenge to say like here's some food that it's not it, it's still gonna it's not just delicious three minutes before it leaves the <clears throat> pass into the dining room it has to be delicious for you know on a reheat <laughs> it has yeah. to be delicious 35 minutes 45 minutes from when we made it um, so there is that that kind of um, uh, strive to be let's try for excellence is how I describe it that can be translated to almost anything I mean I mean and I and I think you see this more in uh the chef world now than ever where it's like I mean like again we'll go back to burgers it's like you know the burger revolution began what maybe 10 15 years 10 12 years ago I'd say yeah. but the fact that you were taking all these super high-end chefs who were like how am I gonna make the most simple comfort food chefy. How am I going to make it delicious? Um, mm. So I, and I, and, and I've already been thinking about this kind of stuff. Like, you know, how, how is that um, creative right brain going to be lent to, um, to take out, to delivery? Yeah. And I just think that there's always going to be a market for that. There's people are going to still be coming to places like, uh, Bardo, Beast and Bottle to to have that um, thought into their food, and it's just going to be in a different. It's just going to be presented differently. Yeah, and so for you, then I know the answer to this, but I want to give you an opportunity to talk about it. Yep. When you think about the burger, or you think about the pizza, Coperto, you think about any of the things that you're producing at Beast and Bottle. Are you going to do the burger a la Holman and Finch, where it's just like? burger cheese bread and maybe some onions and like a squirt of sauce or are you going to put 12 ingredients including foie gras and caviar on yeah, your no. burger because sure. that's the way chefs to your point went in those two directions let me just have the best beef and do my own ground and it's brisket and it's chuck and it's sirloin and it's that's thoughtful and i don't have to chef it up too much or the 25 ingredient foie gras burger for $72. Like, where's your head at with that? I, I, those, those foie gras burgers are such bullshit. I, 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 there we go. They, yeah. they suck. Um, <laughs> and I, so I can, I, I can answer that question pretty easily in that, you know, two things that I, we, we actually, before we closed, we had a lamb burger on the menu at Beast and Bottle. And that really came about from our whole animal program. It's like, hey, we have some extra trim. Like, let's try this. Let's see how this goes. And I can tell you that getting that right grind was challenging to make it not greasy, to have it not dry out. And um, we actually ended up with a blend of both uh, shoulder and belly. 
uh, because that's what we thought made the best. And then, you know, from there, it was pretty simple, man. It had, it had like a, it had some local Persian cucumbers and some bib lettuce and a yogurt sauce on top. And, that's it. but yeah, but that was it. And, and because that's what accentuated how delicious the local meat was. It didn't need, you know, caramelized onions and green peppercorns and bacon. Like, no, those things, they can sometimes have their place. But, uh, but it really, it, it was just about kind of dialing it back a little bit. And maybe, and maybe that's really how food is going to be in the next six months. It's going to be like, take a step back and, yeah. and, and let's like put, let's put flavor first, put, and maybe we'll put, my hope is that we'll put sourcing first and, and then, and from there. But, um, but yeah, I mean, and also like pizza, man, I mean, pizza and I know Max would share this with me too. Juan chef, like pizza's hard, dude. It's hard. It's alive. It's hard to get it consistent. And yeah. um, having dough recipes that change with the seasons, with the humidity um, is, is, is about as chefy as you can possibly get. I admire the hell out of places like, car driver and blue pan that can have this homemade dough that's just like dialed in and perfect all the time it is more challenging than i thought it was going to be absolutely so you think that as as food has gotten so zhuzhed up and we spent so much time with the swoosh sauce and the the deconstruct the plates and all these different things and we have both been guilty of that plenty of times like in our oh. careers for sure and so now you're thinking about the simplicity do you think that all the up and coming chefs, the young cooks that are out there right now are going to be inspired to figure out how to make a burger? Or are they going to go, why the fuck would I want to make a burger? I don't want to work at a burger place. How do you, how do you reconcile that? Um, man, great question. And before, before I was, uh, before the, 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 I fell off the second time, what I was starting to say is the, what we would describe is, you know, America just went through their like golden age of fine dining. Right. Like, yep. like we, we were leading, we were leading the world. Um, that came out of the recession of 2008. And I, I think that there will be new ways of cuisine and a new fine dining that comes out of this. It's probably just going to take longer to get there than we want. Um, if, you know, and, and, and then America kind of has like a, and that's just, just cuisine in general kind of follows a pattern like that where we'll, we'll high end will come out of a certain time and then it will, it will kind of decrease itself and get back to the like, you know, burgers and fried chicken and pizza, which is like what it's we good all stuff. It's yeah, good dude, stuff. We all love it. I mean, tacos, burgers and pizza. Like we all love that uh, for, for sure. a reason. It's delicious. It makes us feel good. Um, but you're going to see, I, I think that there will be a rebirth of fine dining out of this. It's not going to happen quickly yeah. for young chefs that are coming up. And I would, and I would say this to any of them, if they were going into fine dining or they were going into, if they wanted to make great burgers, it's just like, just find a chef, find a restaurant where you resonate with their values and go from there. <laughs> yes, that's it. I mean, that's the whole, literally this whole show is why and who before what and how, like, we get so caught up in the minutia of what we do and how we do it, yet why you've traveled around the country to like source good products around Colorado, source good products, you know, going fishing in New England because you wanted to get connected to those products in a more meaningful way. Now, when you serve that product, it's why and who, because it doesn't matter what you do to it. It's fucking amazing already because you met the guy who literally caught it, right. threw it in the box, who sent it to you. You want that, to do everything. The story now. of my restaurants, which is, you know, food has a story, right? That's it. Every food has a story, and the best food has the best stories, and it's on us to tell those stories. The end. The show's over. Hi, Paul, Jeff, that's dude, that's it, man. I love it. I appreciate it. Apparently, <laughs> you you were the uh, the tortoise, and one was the hare because you kept that, out, but in the end, you're still standing, my friend. I really appreciate the banter. I appreciate that you started the conversation between between Juan, myself. And me. <laughs> it, was, it was really important. For sure it was important. And in moments there was emotions flying around and, and I disagreed and you disagreed and Juan. And like, there was a lot of that. At the end of it, I was like, I still love everything about you guys. I respect and admire what you're doing. 
I love that we can have a difference of opinion and at the end of it, still be working together to try and figure out how we navigate this. We need more of that because too often we're just so visceral and think that because I'm right, that must mean that you're wrong. And the fact is, I'm probably not right and you're probably not wrong. And there is some truth in in kind of that back and forth. So I appreciate it. I hope this can be a time of unity for the industry. And I, and I think it will be. And, and I think exactly what you said there, man, is we're all going to bring different opinions to the table. And if we can all bring them and find a it's, it's the melting pot scenario all over again. Right. So I love it. All right, Paul. Bye bye. Get to it, man. Well, Cheers. Appreciate you. All right. That was just like a microcosm of everything happening in the industry. Great minds thinking, bantering, different opinions, different focus points, uh, agreeing wholeheartedly on things, technology, and just falling in and out. It was all the things. It was an emotional roller coaster for sure. And that's what's happening right now. And again, that's just like the thing that was so important for me to have this conversation was like, yes, there were some very specific practical things that I think you can take away from this. If you're working in a restaurant, if you are a restaurateur, if you are a chef, however, the underlying message of that you can disagree or that you can have a slightly different focus point within the industry, there's room for that. That is okay. That is the way that it should be. Dissenting voices often create the best possible outcomes. If you surround yourself or create an industry of status quo, yes, people, you're fucked. Like you're totally fucked. There's no opportunity for evolution, growth, and development. And I think that's what we need now more than ever. And so to hear these two who have built complete brands on the chef-driven concepts, which are a huge challenge already, to now be talking about the need for being dynamic, the need for not worrying so much about what's on the plate, but why, who, and how that stuff gets to the plate is even more important. And they both mentioned taking care of your teams, which I could not agree with more. So thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate it. I'm going to be right back with Ace Linnea Spidell, who is a dear friend, a chef, badass cook, family man, and Ace is deaf. And Ace taught me so much about communication that I still keep with me today. When you see the way that I articulate with my mouth and how much I use my hands, so much of that animation came from recognizing my own shallowness when it came came to how I thought you were supposed to communicate in a kitchen. And so I'm really grateful to have this conversation. He is amazing at reading lips. So that is why I speak like this and why we will be able to have a conversation. So give us about 10 minutes, check back in. Appreciate everyone. Cheers.